Okay, so carrying this issue about integrated wise even farther. The basic idea at close is that there are, as it were, layers of multiple planes of existence. Now, a plane of, a plane of existence means the way your thoughts are occurring in your head at the time you're going through your life during a day. That's your plane of existence. The quality and level of your thinking. On any given day, there are a bunch of people thinking. They are all living at their own individual plane of existence, which plane is determined by the thoughts going on in their head at the time. That's the thing to understand about what plane of existence means. Because that thought, that phrase has been used a lot. And it's really been misused a lot. Okay. Um, Marcus Aurelius, who is a Roman emperor, once said, our, thought, our life is as our thoughts make it. Marcus Aurelius Antonius. Okay, he was supposed to be the, the the emperor that was the guy played by, um, oh, I forget what the actor's name is, in uh, the movie Gladiator. Okay. Marcus Aurelius Antonius was the, the emperor in history. 162 AD. Um, until about 180 AD is when he ruled. Now, the Bible's version of that same statement... It's Proverbs 23, 6. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Okay. The word translated heart in English isn't the word heart. It's the word soul. Okay. As you think in your soul, that's the real you. The soul is the real you. Not your body. Your soul. Okay. So your plane of existence, the quality and height of it, is determined by what's going on in your head. So as you can now begin to see, oh, wow, if that's the definition of a plane of existence, and your what's going through your head constantly is, okay, Dad, what should I be thinking? What should I be thinking? How does Bible doctrine apply to this? Oh, this is such a boring activity. How can I get Bible out of it? I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to do something for the doctrine because everything else is too boring a motive. That's a high plane of existence. That's God's plane of existence. Because what did Jesus Christ do? Right? He's the perfect man. The one we should all emulate. What did he say? Matthew 4.4. 4. Thank you, Dad. Live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the standard. It's clearly the highest standard. It's clearly the highest plane of existence. Notice it has nothing to do with morality. Obviously, morality is not, you know, incompatible with it, but it's light years above morality. Live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Think about that. Let's see, what would God like as my choice for breakfast? It's moral to eat breakfast. There are a whole bunch of things you can choose to eat for breakfast that are moral choices. But not all of them are godly choices I don't mean godly in the sense of right or wrong I mean godly in the sense of highest best, most useful most interesting, most beneficial gee God what should I eat for breakfast God's going to want you to eat for breakfast something that builds your spiritual life as well as your body life but the spiritual life isn't morality it's better higher Morality is just to get along horizontally down here. Spirituality is vertical to God. There are a whole bunch of activities that are moral, but not everything's profitable. Remember what Paul said? All things are, you know, what do you want, permissible, but not everything is profitable. So morality is nothing, has no place here. 
that the morality is another horizontal plane of existence very far below the question well, what's God thinking see if I write this email what, what kind of Bible doctrine could be brought to bear to make it more meaningful make it more valuable make it more enjoyable how you spend your time how you spend your thoughts what your thoughts are on that's your plane of existence now when you define it that way all of a sudden everything really starts to shake out okay there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of planes of existence one person's getting up and thinking about farting and who they're going to go out with and whether they look sexy in the mirror another person's going to get up and be thinking about their aches and pains and how resentful they are about having them another person's going to get up and look how beautiful they are and how important they are and be all proud of themselves Another person's going to get up and be thinking about whatever's on the television. Not about anything else about self, but about television. Another person's going to get up and be thinking about their dog, their cat, their children, their something. See, where you spend your thoughts, where your thoughts are, that's where your treasure is. Okay, so then your treasure is not Bible doctrine if your thoughts aren't on Bible doctrine. Your treasure is not God if your thoughts aren't on God. Notice how it can be in the name of God and it can be in the name of the Bible, but really be about something else. Using Bible and God to sort of buttress your ego and justify what it is you already want to do anyway. All these categories of thoughts assault omniscience all the time God is hearing it all all the time he heard it a billion years ago he'll be hearing it a billion years from now when in as far as a moment of real time is long past what happened to the world and all the thinking that was in the world 2,000 years ago is still occurring in the mind of God this is one of the most important spiritual lessons I think I can say I've learned from him. Matthew 4.4, 4, always occurring. I was busy asking him about this. I want to say it was like 10, 15, 10 years ago. Maybe 10, yeah, about 10 years ago. Walking back and forth in my living room trying to figure out, why did you make me? What the hell kind of purpose could, what value could there be to you to see me be alive? Yeah, okay, Christ paid for my sins. Okay, why don't you just send me to oblivion after death? I needed to be here in order to sin so he could pay for sin, so he could be big enough, and he's pleasing to you, I get that. But why should I exist after that? And the answer is Matthew 4.4 4, always occurring. In other words, because he exists, because he has the thinking, because his thinking was built, now can be put in us. That's what Peter's talking about. When he's saying leaving an example. Greek word there is hupogromnoi, wax tablet. If Christ's thinking gets written in me, then it's okay if I live forever. Because then his thinking is in me. It doesn't matter what I am. It matters that his thinking is there. That's what God gets out of it. It's really pleasing to hear his son's thinking, no matter where it is. Okay, well now, anything. Okay, but it applies the same way to everything you're acting on. If I'm using Bible doctrine and I'm picking something to eat for breakfast then as it were the food that I choose is now baptized with the doctrine that I use to pick it and God forever sees that reason for the picking of the food and that's pleasing to him Matthew 4 4 always occurring it's always occurring 
So the fundamental integrated why is dad will always have the pleasure of seeing a doctrinal thought in you applied to whatever it is you're thinking or doing rather than all that other nonsense that everybody else is thinking and doing. And it really does do something for God. It's pleasing. Don't you like what's pleasing to you? There's a whole bunch of stuff that's not pleasing to you. And you're willing to put up with it. But boy, oh boy, don't you like those moments when something that pleases you is going on. Okay, so how much more God? Because that's like the ultimate integrated why. Is that the Matthew 4.4 4 is always occurring because you say, okay, God, well, what should I be thinking? And maybe you're not sure and he doesn't answer sometimes because he wants you to guess. Because that's part of learning. You know? And you guess. And you're really not sure, but you're trying to be sure. And he knows you're not sure. And you might even get it wrong. But you know what? You wanted to. And that pleases him that you wanted to. Versus Jane Doe gets up and eats her Kellogg's because it's low in calories and then my body will look good. Yeah, maybe it will, but God didn't have anything to do with it. And she might even be a Christian and, you know, properly go to church on Sunday and sing all the songs and, and pat herself on the back that she went there and call herself a good Christian. But God had nothing to do with what she chose for breakfast. Because she wasn't interested. You see the difference? This is beyond morality. This is about what's enjoyable and meaningful versus something else that isn't necessarily immoral, but it's certainly not so much, not as enjoyable. Okay, so millions upon millions of humans are alive right now living on these much lower planes of existence. Maybe their plane of existence is all about TV and politics. Maybe their plane of existence is all about humanism and philosophy. Maybe their plane of existence is where they are, you know, thinking about cars. Or their other plane of existence is, you know, their kids or checkers, or building a model train. All of those planes of existence can be united instead to God first by putting, oh gee God, I'm going to make this model train. How does that tell me something about you? Because it will, but if they don't want to make that connection, it's not there. So now they're living on a lower plane of existence. Because it's not immoral to want to do a model train. It's certainly not immoral to care about your kids. But it is certainly a lower plane of existence. If God's not involved in it. And God's involvement in it is twofold. Yeah, of course he's involved by his own will. But what about you wanting him to be involved in your life? What about your will? If you don't want him involved, he's not involved, even when he is involved. He stands off. And you want to know why we got the problems in the world today? That's why. Second Chronicles 7.14 tells you, Turn to me, and I'll heal your land. Okay, well, what's the land of the Christian? Anywhere his footsteps, and everything contiguous to it. Because you're on this earth, you're salt of the whole earth, not just parts of it. So if you want to do good for your fellow man, if you want to get rid of the terrorists, you want to end world hunger, even if, you know, you're sure that abortion is wrong, and you want to get rid of it, then live toward God. But Christians don't do that. They live in His name. But not toward him. This people, what was it? This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The word for heart in the Bible means the believing part of your soul. 
heart, you know, has a connotation of where your interests are, where your loves are, where your focus is. It's not talking about your physio physiological heart. That's just a pump. It's talking about the part of your soul that is chooses the will, the part where you like to be inside your thoughts. In other words, your plane of existence, where your thoughts go, the traveling of your thoughts, where they travel. That's a horizontal, you know, function. Going outward. Now, that means that everybody around you is living on lower planes of existence. To the extent you're, you're thinking vertically toward God. Okay? And where I close in the last increment is, you know, practice right away just thinking toward God and trying to, as it were, insert the God question into everything just for the sake of having a happier life. It's doing much more than that. But I'm focusing on it's a happier way to live, more meaningful. And then in the later days, you know, eternity... That's going to be necessary because everybody currently in, in eternity is living a lower horizontal plane of existence. And they're going to need your higher level of thinking in order to gain anything at all. And enjoy a higher version of thinking themselves, even in the eternal state. Now, the really remarkable thing about this is that both today and tomorrow there is a kind of unity think of I don't know if you have them but you should be able to at least Google on the term Venetian blinds there are two kinds of Venetian blinds lateral horizontal style and vertical look for just the, the horizontal Venetian blinds You'll notice that there are strips, usually, but not always, of plastic that are tied kind of like in a, a sheet, but they're, they're strips, and they're threaded so that you can turn like a, a, a stick and open them and or turn the stick and they close them. Okay, Venetian blinds is what they're called. Now, the idea is to let in light, but not make the window visible, you know, enough to the outside. So you can let light in, but not be seen inside. That's why they were invented. Now, those are all individual strips. Think of each of the individual horizontal strips of the Venetian blind as a plane of existence from high at the top to low at the bottom of a person. The, the string tying all those blinds together so that they can turn up or down in unison is God uniting, as it were, all of the people together to work as a society synergistically as a whole. That's what your thinking will be used to do if you mature in Christ is to unite everybody below you and God will cause that to happen there's some kind of very personal it, it's kind of scary to me the more I think about it but I, I have to say it anyway it, it's some kind of very personal keying of the population of your kingdom to your own soul See, all of us together collectively are called body of Christ, bride of Christ. You know that. Well, think about that's like a grand... Think of church as body of Christ as a grand Venetian blind horizontal so that there's Christ at the very top. Okay, and then there's X number of persons, probably Paul's up there, you know, just below him and then going all the way down. Okay, now think of each one of those slats in the Venetian blind as a whole kingdom. 
Whereas if you if you like took it apart and did a real great close up, you would find that each one of the slats as a Venetian blind is itself another Venetian blind with a bunch of people beneath. Okay, so it looks like one slat. If you were to do a close up, it's really a whole Venetian blind all by itself that can be unrolled. So that each each one of us is going to have X number of people below us, and we're going to be below X number of others. So think of the grand Venetian blind of the body of Christ as a federation of kingdoms, and each slat is a kingdom. All right, or, where if you look close up, that slat of the blind would actually be its own, another Venetian blind itself that's of X length, with the whole population in it. God unites us all that way so that we all reflect Christ in aggregate. And when that body has been completed, there's no prediction how long it takes, then the rapture occurs. And that's Ephesians 4, 12, and 13. Okay? And it specifically says what the criterion for the rapture is. The maturation. It looks like it's corporate rather than individual. The individual maturation appears to be of the kings. And what's really you know, shocking to me about that is that the implication there, especially given Ephesians 4.16 in context, the implication there is that when your soul is completed to kingship, A, that's when you're going to die, or soon after, because that's what happened to Paul, was that 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, and secondly, the implication is that your kingdom, the people who will be in your kingdom, it sounds like many of them, or at least some of them, will be people you knew in this life. But they're fit together from wherever they end up being into your kingdom based on how your soul got completed. So, just as we are a mosaic collectively of Christ himself as body, so all the people in your kingdom are a mosaic collectively of you. I wish what I just said could be proven false. I've just outlined why it makes sense to call it true. I don't like it. I don't want it to be true. But how can it not be true? If the King of Kings, if that's what we are, a reflection of Christ, Revelation 4 1, Sea of Glass. Okay? If that's what we are, Ephesians 4 12 and 13, the body of Christ collectively mature, reflecting Him. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, and the, the, the reflection is His head, which is love which is the Word of God, mature in the Word of God. If that's all true for him, then it has to be true for each of the kings. And that there are going to be kings is in Isaiah 53, 12. What that And to the, what are literally are called the mighty ones, he will share out the booty, he Christ. He inherits everybody, and then he shares out everybody to the kings, the mighty ones. Atsumim means the mighty. Yechalik Shalal means he shares out the booty. The booty are the people. That was in the previous clause. Okay, so then the scariest thing is, I'm supposed to be a king over people who are being specially selected to fit me. Even as we're being especially groomed to fit him. Like a Venetian blind, where you've got the stick that, you know, everybody turns up and down together in unison. They're each individual, they're each their own thing, they're each obviously independent, and yet made to be fitting together. 
Now that being the case then, in eternity then, what do you think it's going to be now? God is consistent. That means somehow it's true now too. Only it can be lost. You can opt out. So you're either going toward that goal or away from that goal in any moment. But doesn't God foreknow which way you're going? Sure he does. So doesn't he fit everything together in light of that? Sure he does. Now the the timing is exquisite. And uh, you know, you're gonna have to talk to God about this in your own case. But when I look back on my life, because I'm sixty two now. When I look back on my life and I see what I understand now versus what I was thinking before, it's astonishing to me how he fitted everything together. Sometimes I think I'm going to die soon because I, th I mean, this is getting so crystal clear to me now how this works. And maybe I will. I'd like to. I wish I was dead yesterday, but, you know, the doctrine is in me, so I don't know if I should say I should die or live. If the doctrine's here, then maybe I ought to stay here. Because it's here. The only reason for me to get up in the morning is because the doctrine's in my in my soul. Should it be here on earth in my soul? Or should it be dead and it's in my soul there? I don't know. But that's the dilemma that Paul faced. See, all the people that are talked about in the Bible are paradigms of an average human being down here. What is supposed to happen? There's nothing special about them. Paul himself said he was the worst sinner who ever lived. Well, I'm not as bad a sinner as Paul. Can't be. Okay, so now what happened to Paul happens to me. What happened to Christ happens to us. So it's not about how good you are. It's the design. Abraham's life tells you the design. Jacob's life tells you the design. Certain features of each life are given to us to know, to tell us the design. Because if it was true for Abraham, it's true for you. If it was true for Christ, it's true for you. If it was true for Paul, it's true for you. That's why we get those stories. And of course, Christians aren't learning that. They're busy trying to set those people on pedestals so that they'll never learn what the spiritual life is. We learn about their lives to learn about our own. It's paradigmal. Now having said that, so you're going through your life now and you know that you're supposed to be a king and these people are supposed to be fitted to you and it's supposed to be like a Venetian blind but you're here now and you can't see that happening. But you don't have to see it happening. You just have to know it's the design. It's paradigmal. Okay, so the next part about integrated why is, okay, God, how do I integrate today into tomorrow when I don't know what tomorrow's going to be? What should I be thinking, Dad? Just keep asking that question all day. And then when you get to the end of the day, he'll show you, if you ask, some of how what you were thinking at the beginning of the day fit into your prior life and your current life and other insights how the slats fit together in the Venetian blind. Others, of course, can't see it. They're on the outside of the blind. The older you get in Christ, the more you see how it fits together. It's, it's very... Um, on one hand, you could call it exciting. On the other hand, you could call it way too intense. On the other hand, you can call it like, just stop your mouth, I can't breathe, I can't move, let me lay down. People think that, oh, when you find out and see proof of God, then you'll you you know you'll live happily ever after. Not at all. It's opposite. Now the spit really hits a fan. So, think about those things as you contemplate this business of living on different planes of existence, knowing that your average Joe Blow is just thinking about his tea and baguette or what he'll do when he gets home from work. 
and that that kind of thought pattern is actually building a permanent structure in the soul and that's how the soul will still think once dead and will need a king knitted together as a Venetian blind to give him any kind of unity or higher enjoyment at all.